There's going to be a bit of a lag on the Facebook page. We are now live. Hopefully. Yes. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Ideas Conclave. Um, I'm Humera. I work as a librarian. And today we have Mr. Ramesh Gunasakera as part of our Ideas Conclave session for this month. Mr. Gul uh, Ramesh Gunasakera, hi. Hi. He Very is nice a fellow. To be here. Thank you so much. And uh, he, Mr. Ramesh is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and has also received a national honor in Sri Lanka. His first book, The Reef, was. Uh, um, shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1994. And since then, he has published many novels and short stories. And his current book, The Sun Catcher, it's available digitally as well as in the nearest bookshop, near you, be it in Pakistan or worldwide. Hello, Mr. Yep. Ramesh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How I'm has... doing fine. Nice to, nice to be here. There's the book, just in case people need to have a look at it. Um, yeah, amazing, so, amazing. thanks and, for having um, How has the year been? How has the year been? It's been very strange. Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult. It's a bit like traveling through from one world to another. I was lucky enough, actually, the last time um, I actually traveled physically was, I think, to Pakistan, to Lahore for the mm -hmm. um, literature festival, literary festival. And uh, since then, it's been kind of lockdown, no lockdown, no travel, no movement. Um, I've been on various uh, literary festivals, but all on Zoom, as it were. So it's been very I think Technology has eroded any borders that we could have, you know, like the borders that we have, the travel that we do. Technology has like, Rashtar, you are here from UK and I'm here from Pakistan and it's an amazing yeah. time and a weird time in a way. Yeah, no, it is great. It's great to have that uh, uh, that whole business of, of the borders disappearing, especially for a writer, because that's, that's, that's the business we are in, actually. We want to get rid of all the borders uh, of any sort, really. So I think that's something to celebrate. But... I'm a little sad as well, not about the borders, but simply, mm -hmm. you know, you can have all this interaction, but it's, but it's, uh, it, the, it's on a certain dimension. And um, so that even this event, for example, it's nice. I'm, you know, I'm really pleased that we're able to do it. It's good to have the interaction with you, but not being able to see everybody else who's listening in and not being able to interact um, with them. And for example, like Raza was just saying a few minutes ago in setting this up, how you know it came out because he met me uh, at the Lahore Festival. And you know, I and he was showing me the book that I signed for him. You know, all of those little things disappear. And uh, so I get to go to uh, to all sorts of festivals through Zoom but I don't really leave my room. So it's really strange. It has been definitely a um, difficult, weird year for everybody around. And also, have you been keeping up on any writing or reading? Or have you been doing something? Oh, yeah, yeah. Have... I mean, for, for a writer, in a way, it's quite good because although, you know, it's a pity not to be able to go and see all these places and people and interact, in a way, all of those things are distractions for a writer. You know, if you're, if you're trying to write a book, the best thing you can do is actually be locked into a room and to get on with it. So, yeah, so I think I've probably done more writing as a result, which is good. Okay. Um, and for me, it's not a problem. Um, in fact, it's, it's quite helpful discipline. I think earlier on in the lockdown here in the UK, in March, April, um, we were only allowed to go outside for one hour every day to do some exercise. As a result, mm -hmm. I think I was 
probably fitter as well because every day I did go out for an hour and do my exercise and then came back and did my writing. So it was, it was very good in that way, yeah. That's amazing. Um, I, that was part of my question. What is your writing process like? Was it, how was it like before? Uh, well, it, it, it hasn't changed hugely, except that I probably spend a bit more time and a little less distraction. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, my writing process has changed over time. As you were saying earlier, I mean, I've written quite a few books now. That's, I think it's about 10 altogether. Um, wow. And the way I wrote the first books are very different from the way I, I write the current books, as it were. And that's mainly to do with mm -hmm. time, or you could say allocation of time. I mean, when you're, when you're younger and busier, it's really hard to find the time to write. That's what most, most people who are trying to be writers will say. There are great difficulties finding time to write. But in a way, you know, if you wanted to, you can always find the time. It's just how you do it. So, you know, in the early books, I would be oh. writing before I go to work, whereas now I spend the morning writing. Okay. Uh, so do you think uh, um, writing short stories is more lucrative or writing a full complete novel? I think in one of your interviews, you mentioned Monkfish, uh, your, uh, your short collection mm -hmm. of short stories, Monkfish Moon, that uh, your publisher was, or one of your agents was not in, um, he was, they were not accepting a short story. Not keen, not keen, yeah. Um, not yeah, keen I, on it. Yeah, I think, I think oh. there, are, there are differences. Um, lucrative is probably the wrong word. I mean, very few writers find any kind of writing at all financially lucrative. I think it's a question of, in terms of, publication and I think mm. in countries like the UK getting a book of short stories published by by mainstream publishers is much more difficult uh, getting any mm. fiction published these days is quite difficult but short stories are more difficult but on the other side of that is in many other countries the publishing a situation is such that short stories and novels are pretty much equal. Like in Pakistan, for example, I, I, I suspect if you're writing stories that maybe as it'll be very similar. Um, whereas here in the UK, it is much more difficult to do a book of stories. But in recent years, again, technology has changed things. Um, there are small, smaller publishers around who are happier to take on a book of short stories. Uh, there's the internet as well, where there's a lot of opportunity for publishing short fiction uh, because you don't publish long novels on the internet on the whole. But um, the whole business of publishing has dramatically changed because the, the physical process is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. It's really the distribution and getting people to read it is the more difficult part. But even there, you know, there's the social media, all of those things. So. The landscape is changing a lot, I think. Um, but when I started um, I writing, self... sorry, so, sorry, continue. Uh, no, I, I was start... talking about self publishing. Yeah, there is a lot of self publishing now, and it's it's uh, it's a legitimate way of publishing, which mm -hmm. <clears throat> is different from, you know, thirty years ago when I started writing. You know, self publishing was seen as vanity publishing only. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't hear that term anymore. Uh, it's just one way of publishing now. Um, so those things are open to people. Uh, Self-publishing is hard. It's not easy to do it properly. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, you but were I know also lots. saying about when you started when you started writing, you were saying something about yeah. I, I, I it was more difficult more difficult to get short stories published. I was very lucky. I mean, Monkfish Moon, my first book was a book of short stories, and it was quite rare for a for a writer to start off with short stories in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously in Pakistan, you have, you know, the, the shining example of Manto and people like that. So it's very, very different. Um, but here, I think at that time, Ian McEwen was the only other writer I could think of who had started off with a, with a book of short stories. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, for me, it was just the right sort of thing because uh, because it was unusual, um, 
and it got noticed very surprisingly, yeah. So um, I would like to know your thoughts on authors and using social media. Do you think that social media influences conversations around themes and subjects of the book that you are thinking of writing? Yes. Or does it yes. influence you to bring up a theme? Yes, it is influential. Um, and social media can be very useful, I think. Um, it's interesting how much, you know, there's a, there's quite a lot of stuff on social media about books. You know, people yes. writing about books, talking about books and so on. And that's not surprising because in a way, you know, a lot of the internet uh, has been driven by the sharing of books. I mean, even, even you know, the giant Amazon started out as a book distribution exactly. thing. Um, so it's, it's, I think, at the heart of it, in a way, it's quite important. Uh, and for readers, I think it's quite a nice way of sharing, sharing thoughts about books uh, and things like that. For, the, for a writer, it's, it's a mixed blessing, I think. It can be very distracting. Um, you can spend an awful lot of time um, mm -hmm. writing ephemera, you know, writing things for for the instant only. Mm -hmm. And in a way, books, and in fact, the whole idea behind writing is completely the opposite. It's about the long term, it's about longevity, it's about having words that last more than, you know, the few words that I'm saying now, which is for the for the moment. And so there is a kind of contradictory push and pull in it. Um, and a writer can, I think, you, know, you, you you do find lots of very well-known writers who spend a lot of time on social media and write a lot of books. You know, they're able to do that. But for other writers, I think they, they may find that suddenly a lot of their concentration is going on trying to get their tweets uh, going at the right time rather than trying to get their sentences right in a book. Um, so I think that can have a negative effect. Um, because a lot of, um, I follow a lot of authors on Twitter, you know, they're so active and commenting and bringing that part also in their uh, books as well. So do you think there's an emotional attachment to whatever you have written and uh, the, what you want to produce and what, what you want your readers to read? Is there an emotional attachment in your writing process? I think so, yes. And I, I mean, you know, you know, part of the writing, there are two sides to the writing process. There's, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a very fundamental one, which is to do with self-expression. And that's probably mm -hmm. is, is the starting point. Uh, you write because you have a creative impulse that you want to somehow express. And you might do it through music, you might do it through painting, you might do it through carpentry, you might do it through all sorts of things. But if you're a certain kind of person, you do it through words and writing. And, and for that, it's the satisfaction you gain from actually putting your thoughts into words. The second type or the second stage almost is to do with communication and this desire to communicate. Um, and that's where a writer who not only writes, but wants to be published, that comes from a desire to communicate. Not all writers want to be. And in fact, in history, I suppose, most writers didn't communicate in that way. They, you know, they wrote their things, they wrote their books, they had no idea whether anyone would read them or who would read them, whether they'd ever get published or read. And some of our most, you know, best loved or famous writers, you can think of, uh, certainly in the English language, you know, didn't see publication in their lifetime. And their communication is really not the individual writer, but it's a communication of the book with the reader. And I think that's really, really important. Now, that's changed because of our current world and technology and social media and so on. Mm -hmm. And as writers, we are very, very, in a way, quite lucky in that we can be in touch with readers you know, um, whereas if I was writing, you know, 150 years ago, 
I may never meet anyone who has ever read a book that I've written. Um, I wouldn't have this encounter, for example. So in a way, that's really, really lucky. But it's also a little bit like a drug. Mm -hmm. You kind of like it and you want more of it. And that's why writers get into social media and like this idea that, yes, people are. But, you know, the sad truth is sometimes with, a lot, with some writers anyway, and maybe with most writers who are successful in social media, they probably have more people reading their tweets than reading their mm, books. That I think is rather sad. Yeah. So do you think, where, have you ever thought that, okay, um, have you been surprised by readers coming up to you and you, you being surprised that my book reached this region as well? And do you have, uh, whenever you write or whenever your book is published, do you have an idea where this particular book should be read in? Like, um, if, if we talk okay, about the man. That's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, um, I have been surprised, yes, uh, because, mm -hmm. uh, for example, I'm surprised that there are uh, readers in Pakistan who are reading my books. Um, I'm less surprised now because I've been to Lahore a couple of times and I've seen how much people like to read books generally. And I've met quite a few students on my trips who've said that they've read my books and so on. So I kind of know that. But when I first discovered that, that was quite a surprise. And even now it's a bit of a surprise, uh, even that we're doing this, that there's enough interest. Because as a, as a writer, I mean, I... I'm still living in my mind quite some time ago before all the social media, when I kind of grew up with the idea that um, a book will reach its readers over quite a long period of time, that it's not an mm -hmm. instant thing. And when my first books were published, you know, I, you know it was before people did so much online, um, before email, people used to actually write letters and tell me that they've read this mm -hmm. book. And I'd get a letter from the middle of America or uh, from Uganda or from somewhere in India and Pakistan. And I just, um, it would really surprise me that, oh, someone has picked this up. Um, and well, I, you know, you work for the British Council. I used to travel quite a lot for the British Council. So I did come across readers all over the world uh, who, who were reading what I'd written then. So that was very gratifying. Um, your second question is, do I write expecting certain things? Um, the honest answer is probably no. I hope that people who've read my previous books will read my next book or my new book. But I also know that in, in the world today, it's not quite as it used to be. Um, I don't know how you, you know, as a librarian, you probably have mm -hmm. a good good answer for this, but I know that when I was growing up, for example, uh, if I came across an author I really liked, uh, say Graham Greene, I remember liking, I would then read every book that he'd written. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd try to get hold of every, I'd go to the library if I couldn't afford it. Um, mm -hmm. And I would try to read everything this author had written. Now, I'm not sure the people's relationship with books are, is the same anymore. And I have a slight feeling, and I get this from actually uh, literary festivals and so on, that people sometimes are satisfied with kind of a single encounter, um, that they read one book, they like mm -hmm. it, and that's it. Um, and sometimes that also works with social media. You know, people are connected, so, you know, have follow somebody on, on, on Twitter or Facebook, and then they feel they don't need to read the book because they have a connection. Um, or they come to a literary event at a literature festival and they say, oh, I've seen him. Have you read his mm -hmm. books? Oh, no. Have you read her books? No, no, but I've seen her. I've heard her. And that's enough for them. And that, I think, is a bit of a pity. I would like it always to be a continuing relationship and fundamentally one with the book and what exists there. So um, that relationship with the book as a, a part of a, um, uh, me being a librarian and being an avid reader, I can tell you that children are really, really uh, into reading and uh, also into digital because now um, 
ebooks have evolved, audio books have evolved, but parents do come in and they say that we want physical copies for our children. So the physical book, and especially this year has, um, I, I mean, I just previously tweeted that a shout out to all the authors for keeping me sane in this year. And if it weren't any author, there wouldn't be any um, escape. And uh, you know, fiction, especially, being it, it's a form of, a form of escape. Um, would you agree yeah. with? Me? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that I would. I'm not sure that use the word escape, but I think it's to mm -hmm. me it's it's both a kind of. It's almost a for me it's an escape into reality rather than away mm -hmm. from reality. Um, mm -hmm. It's also a refuge, um, but it's also a way of making making sense of the world when everything else in the world doesn't really make sense. And, you know, the, the beauty of, of a fictional world is that it's a world that is, um, it's not haphazard. No, it it's has conflict, but it's not haphazard. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of uh, it's designed, you know, <laughs> and so there's a rationale and it makes sense somehow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if the if the novel if the fiction doesn't make if there's something wrong with it, it doesn't make sense, then it's unsatisfactory. You don't finish the book or you don't like the book, you throw it away or whatever. You don't do that with the with the real world we are in. In the real world, there's a lot of dissatisfaction there are a lot of things that go wrong but you just have to put up with it i, I think that what in in the sun catcher that you um that, that's your current book and over there you portray these lives of two teenage boys um you've written about them and that entire story is set within a certain period of conflict and how that yeah. affects the yeah. children's life the, both the boys lives separately and also how um, they learn to find refuge as well. Yeah, yeah. So that that this book, um, Sun Catcher, is it's set again. You know, for many of our listeners, many of the students here, mm -hmm. is set in almost in, in a historical period because it's set in the nineteen sixties. Um, so it's a long time ago, in that sense. Um, for me, it's not a historical book in that sense because it's part of my lifetime. Um, yeah. But it is set in a period that is different historically as well, because it's set in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was called Ceylon, not Sri Lanka. It hadn't become a republic. Mm -hmm. It was independent. Um, but it also was before the very long war that Sri Lanka has suffered, the long civil war um, that lasted until 2009. You know, almost 30 years, 29, 27, 30 years. Um, so this is set before that period. And I did that partly because the, no the book I wrote before that, Noontide Toll, um, this one, uh, was set immediately mm -hmm. after the war and has very much to do with the effects of trauma, of effects of war and things like mm -hmm. that. I wanted a story that was before that to see whether the world was different and how different it was. So it's, as you say, it's set in a, in a, in a, in a kind of very special moment. Uh, it's like mm -hmm. six months in 1964. And it's how the world of these two boys changes dramatically because of what happens to them. And it ha it's, it's, it's a personal story. It's not to do with the war, but, it, but in, the, in the background, of course, is lives of their parents and the society mm -hmm. around them, where some of the troubles that might come in the future, mm -hmm. uh, you can just about see those things. Um, but the main story is really about the connections, the friendships we make, and the fragility of that and how easily those can be disrupted and broken. Especially when um, you discuss class disparity in the book. Yes. How so that, that can be amazing. Yes, that's an important mm -hmm. element of the book because one of the boys is comes from a very wealthy family, um, mm -hmm. uh, as you have in 
in many countries, especially you see this disparity, I suppose, uh, you see it in Pakistan. In Asia. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and it is, he comes from a well to do, wealthy family with lots of connections mm -hmm. and so on. And the other boy comes from a more ordinary middle class family, not a poor family, but a, a, a more working day, work a day sort of middle class uh, where the mother works for a radio station, Radio Ceylon as it was then. Radio Ceylon. And the father works in government service. Um, mm -hmm. But the only difference is that the father is also quite political. He's a He's not an activist, but he mm -hmm. uh, is he's a Marxist and he's very keen on on political ideologies. And so this boy Cairo uh, grows up with this politics around him and he meets this boy who doesn't have that dimension. But this other boy just has a very uh, privileged existence. Mm -hmm. And it's how these two worlds come together really and how particularly Cairo it's, it's Cairo's story he's the one who tells the story his in a sense his kind of political awa awakening I would say so um I I uh, noticed a, a lot of nature has been referred to in it and also um uh, this is a the 25th celebration of reef the book cover was also uh, said, uh, mm -hmm. unveiled. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing, by the way, that's an amazing cover who went for the photograph or the artist that was outstanding, eye catching. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A lot of nature is a part of your story. So are you affected it by it? Or? Yeah, it has, it has become that. Um, I mean, when, when the first book was written, when the first novel was written, Reef, in 1994, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't uh, thinking, uh, of nature as a particular thing or ecology or anything like that. But as it turned out, that book, uh, the one of the main characters is, is a marine biologist. I'm not yes. a marine biologist. I know very little about it, but I got very interested in that. And so in that book, he is really interested in coral reefs and their importance. Now, even in the 1990s, I don't think we generally were very aware of the importance of coral reefs in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And climate that book, and climate change. Yeah, it just wasn't, I mean, people were beginning to talk a little bit about it, but about ecology, not climate change. Um, but the the actual function and role of a coral reef wasn't really appreciated at that time. And the novel is set even earlier in, you know, mm -hmm. than the 90s, in the in the early 70s. And at that time, it was certainly not understood at all. And there's very little research even. And I remember trying to learn about it and discovering just how important coral reefs were or could be. And of course, then after the book was published, a few years later, we had, um, what was it, about six, uh, Quite a, almost 10 years later, you had the tsunami uh, that ravaged so yeah. many countries in the region, especially Sri Lanka, where huge numbers of people died. Uh, about 30,000 people died, I think. And you know, some of the effect, bad effect of that tsunami was really a result of the coral reefs having been destroyed by the way we managed them. And so, the book, the novel Reef, I think, has now got a little bit of a uh, sense. Uh, people tend to look at it as a somehow an ecological book as well, that somehow kind of not predicted this, but was concerned with issues that are now really, really, really important. Um, so so it has been feel? there. Well, so how do you feel about it? Well, I, I, I think we are very late in, in recognizing just how much damage we're doing to the environment. I just wrote a piece uh, for, for one of the um, ecological pressure groups uh, about mm -hmm. oceans and uh, just how important they are for the planet, 
and how devastated they are and how there's still time to do things about it to 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 save these oceans and help these oceans these oceans can the oceans can actually help us survive on the planet so i think it's really really important but you know very very soon um the oceans will have more plastic than fish in it and you know it's a really staggering thing to think about uh, and so we really need to do something about it and if the temperatures of the oceans change by a couple of degrees coral reefs die coral reefs die fish die fish die food stocks go down not to mention the fact that lots of islands get you know devastated as well so there's huge issues so these things have i suppose since i wrote that first book has been there so in the most recent book suncatcher um the one of the boys jay is very interested in the natural world mm -hmm. yeah. not so much ecology you know it's before that concern well, came he but he's birds. The, he uh, has he birds and fish and, i mean again people you know it's growing up in south asia we recognize this um how people do mm -hmm do have an interest in these things but jay is 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 more than just interested he has an affinity with this natural world and that's almost his saving grace it's not you know despite his wealth and all that all those other things he has a real connection to the natural world mm -hmm. uh, and he fears for it he worries that somehow this natural world is going to disappear um and cairo learns something something from that how important it is to sort of be in tune with the world that you live in um and that's kind of something that's been in my other books as well there's a book called heaven's edge which i wrote which is a sort of futuristic mm -hmm. book uh, set mm -hmm. in the near future uh, it's dystopian it's where the world has gone really really wrong um but it is about a world that has gone wrong and where there are mm -hmm. eco warriors who are trying to save the world um and uh, various things like that so it's 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 a it's an ongoing concern that i have yeah so in um also this um in the book sun catcher it deals a lot with the because her uh, the mother works in the radio so it deals mm -hmm. a lot with um music jazz yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, pop uh, pop culture yeah rock and roll so um what is uh, your favorite uh, music uh, were, did you put in yourself a bit in that uh, over there or how did you research this entire uh, era uh it is it is out of what i remember partly mm -hmm. uh, but i also researched uh, uh, to find out what people were listening to um but you know 1964 would have been the time of the beatles obviously were very big uh, starting mm -hmm. out um so cairo is a great fan of the beatles but as far as he's concerned he's the only one in colombo in ceylon who who is a real fan uh, it's not true other people were as well but for a little boy like him he thought he was the only one um mm -hmm. there's uh, jerry and the pacemakers was a, it's a big hit at the time um which ha they had a song called don't let the sun catch you crying okay. um and that kind of fits in with this book as well um uh again one of the very popular singers of the period which nobody can quite understand anymore but i think in the history of popular music uh, someone like jim mm. reeves i think was a very very big star in ceylon uh so you have the boys going to a milkshake shop and the guy who's making the milkshake singing a jimmy song so yeah so things that i remember things that i've looked up things that i tried to find out about that i have put into the book it's it's not e it's again for those of you students who are thinking about how books are written and what goes into it when you take something like this which is you know it's only 50 years ago but it's still historical in that sense mm -hmm. uh it's quite hard to work out what the world was like so you can't just rely on memory because your memory plays tricks you sometimes mm -hmm. misremember most of the time you misremember things things that happened in 1980 you might think happened in 1960 
so you have to, you know, you have to find newspapers, you have to find first person records, you try and talk to people, but, you know, talking to people doesn't always help because they don't remember necessarily. So you have to build up this picture. Um, but I, you know, I kind of like to do that in, you know, all my books tend to be set in a specific moment. Even the futuristic one, I've set in a moment where I try to, obviously you can't do research in it, but you try to make that world, um, as I was saying earlier, work as it should. Mm -hmm. And I've written a book, uh, Prisoner of Paradise, which is set 200 years ago. Again, very difficult to do the research. It's set in Mauritius, uh, mm -hmm. and there's very little written about it. There's one, only one or two accounts of that period. And out of that, I try to work out, you know, what did people eat? What did people, how did people dress? What did they, what time did they have lunch? What time did they have dinner? Things like that you have to try and work out. So, so do you think archives and uh, public library spaces, they play an important role for students or for uh, upcoming writers? Very much so, because, uh, you know, that's, that's the source material, really. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, you know, the books you write also become source material for somebody else in due mm -hmm. course. Um, so if somebody wants to know what you know, Sri Lanka was like in, 19, in the 1960s. They can look at newspapers, they can look at books published then, but they can also look at books published now, like this one, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. distills some of that information. Um, and for, for this book, I mean, for this book, I did go to the archives. Uh, the British Library was hugely important to me because I found a book there, for example, mm -hmm. which is a tiny pamphlet. Um, I don't know whether I have a copy of it here. Um, but I found it by accident almost when I was looking for something else. And yeah, it's it's not this book, but it's very similar to this. Uh, what next? Okay. This is a, a publication. This is a communist publication by Leon Trotsky. Mm -hmm. But it was published originally, obviously, in Russian in Moscow, but it was reprinted uh, in Sri Lanka uh, in, in 1960, I can't find the date, in 1965 or so, mm -hmm. um, in Colombo. And the one I found, this is the one I found in a bookshop and I bought, but I found in the British Library one that was published in 19... 62, a couple of years before my story. Nice. And it seemed the perfect little pamphlet for my Cairo to find on his father's bookshelf. Mm -hmm. So I could actually see the real book that might have been the one that he found because it was printed near where he lives. Um, and I only came across it in in a, library. In, in a library. And I was able to look at it and see what it feels like, see what it looks mm -hmm. like. Um, and put it into my story. And, you know, archives, the same thing. You know, I can look up newspapers, I can look up what happened. Uh, and of course, today, these days, with technology, you can do this online. A lot of it you can do online, which is amazing. Online. So um, also, that was for the physical aspects and the historical aspects. How about relationships? Because Jay and Cairo, you've mentioned, it's developed into a beautiful friendship. Mm -hmm. How what was the driving force behind their friendship and how do you um, um, like do you interview people for uh, gauging how human emotions feel at a certain time at a certain um, uh, either they've gone through trauma or what they're experiencing to get the humans to talk about their feelings and for you to yeah them to well as a, as a uh, there are different sorts of writers some writers are very good at interviewing people um mm -hmm and getting information. I'm sure you would be very good at it. Uh, I'm not so good at that. Um, and in a way, I have this uh, strange feeling that I don't want something too direct. So I do listen very well. Mm -hmm. I listen to people talking. I meet a lot of people, but I don't interview them. I listen to what, and okay. you know, years later, I might then think, 
what happens if somebody, I don't know, loses something? How do they behave? And I'll remember what I saw. Uh, so that's the way I suppose I, I kind of get information. Um, and with this book, the story of this friendship it's partly observing people over my whole life in a way but it's also the friendships I've had uh, mm -hmm. and most of the time as a writer you look into yourself and try and understand your own emotions and use that in your in your writing um, and with most writers I think it's true certainly true of me I think uh, I put a little bit of myself into all my characters whether they're men or women, um, you know, there's a little bit of me in all of them. Um, in this book, there's probably quite a lot of me because I grew up at this time, roughly the same age as these boys. So Were you in I, or Cairo? A little bit of both, I think. More, okay. probably more Cairo, um, uh, okay. emotionally, but, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I, you know, I've used things that I've seen and known uh, in that book, um, but some of it is unreliable memory, some of it is totally imagined. And uh, would you, um, in the future, do you see writing a solely um, female-led character in your story? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm in a way there's, I, I have done that, um, there are two books in which the female character is hugely important. Um, one, my second novel is a novel called The Sandglass. The Sandglass, yes. And the sort of the presiding character in that is a woman, but an elderly woman. It's in a sense, the whole book is an exploration of her life, but mm -hmm. she is actually dead. So she doesn't actually narrate it. So it's her son and her son's friend who are kind of exploring or excavating her life. But she is the most dominant or important person. The other book, the book I said was a, uh, set a couple of hundred years ago, this one, The Prisoner of Paradise, the prisoner, is, yes. is set in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. and. Again, the main character there, there's two characters. The main character is this one, mm -hmm. there's a woman. Uh, she's an English woman, English girl, actually, who's about 19, 17 to 19 years old, mm -hmm. um, or Lucy, and she goes to Mauritius and she meets this character who is a man uh, who is originally from Sri Lanka. Um, his name is Don, but this story is, it's, both it, it's the point of view shared between the two of them but uh, it's really led by her it's um i think in, in fact one of the versions that i wrote of it early versions was entirely told by her it was her story but then i've changed it mm -hmm. so that we have both points of view and even in my first even in my first book monkfish moon a couple of the stories there are actually narrated by female characters. Um, so I've always been interested in trying to vary that a little and see whether I can do it. Uh, I have a question from one of the audience member and they want to know that they read somewhere a specific match was somewhat a bit of an influence behind your book, The Match. Which match was it? Okay, so The Match is, let me try and get the book out so I can Oh, I don't have a book. Oh, yes, here's a copy. So that's this book. Um, and uh, this was written some time ago, so I had to think back, but there is, there's, it's written, uh, the setting, if you like, mm -hmm. is quite uh, unusual. It's a, it's, it's a long period of time, from the 70s to the 2000s, but a crucial moment is in, I think, about 2002, I think, uh, and there's a match between, it's a one day international in London mm -hmm. at the Oval where uh, Sri Lanka, which, who was touring England at the time, was playing India. Um, and that match is very important in the novel. And 
it's an interesting one because um, this is, I suppose, this is my cricket novel. It, it, it was written at a time when there were very, there weren't any really cricket novels as such. Uh, oh, there were a few English novels from a long time ago, largely about village cricket, mm -hmm. uh, very light novels. And there were a couple of novels um, where cricket was featured, uh, like Vikram said, Suitable Boy, uh, mm. the cricket is featured, but it isn't the main thing. And I thought uh, at the time when I was writing this, I thought uh, I'd like to write a novel where cricket is kind of like the main metaphor in the novel uh, and a serious novel in which international cricket has a place. And the reason I wanted to do that is because uh, Sri Lanka, you know, the Sri Lankan cricket story um, since 1996, when they won the World Cup, has been really, was a good story for a while. It's become less of a good story in more recent times, but but it was one I, where... I saw the World Cup final. Oh, well, I, I the wish 96 I had. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was, that, it was that amazing story, which is so different from the story of the war in Sri Lanka. So I wanted to write mm -hmm. about that. And, and I thought, you know, that no one has written a novel like that. So I guess it was, one, it was the first of the, you know, now you have loads and loads of novels, particularly South Asian novels on cricket, good ones as well. But this was one of the we first. Have, and, um, sorry? Uh, we have uh, we have a cricket novel recently written by Umar Shahid Hamid called The Fix, and he wrote it from yes. the women's cricket uh, team's point of view. Yes. So, uh, would you be writing more on cricket as well? I'm not sure whether I will or not. Uh, when I was writing this book, um, uh, the um, I was I got I was you know very obsessed with cricket, um, especially for the book, and. I went to all these matches, including that mm -hmm. match I just mentioned, the one at the Oval uh, with India and, and Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And I put that one in this book mainly because, just to finish that bit of the story, is that um, the main character in this book is a man called Sonny, Sonny Fernando, and he wants to be a photographer. Mm -hmm. He's not a cricketer. He wants to be a photographer. Okay. And uh, he goes to this match um, partly because he suddenly got interested in Sri Lankan cricket and he goes to try and find out uh, what he feels about it. Um, and in this match, um, there's a moment when uh, Sachin Tendulkar is batting and he hits this ball mm -hmm. and he goes along the ground actually. And he goes mm -hmm. at one point where there's a flock of pigeons on the ground and it hits one of the pigeons yeah. and the whole game stops and and as as all your cricket fan students know you know a one day international is a very noisy affair uh, especially especially if these sorts of South teams Asian are playing teams and it was an incredibly noisy affair but when this pigeon fell down on the ground hit by the ball everything went silent. No. And so in my um, story, I put that moment in and mm -hmm. I made my character rush down to the ground from the terraces and take a picture of this, this pigeon, which um, I think it was Mahela Jaya Warden that picked it up in the end. Mm -hmm. And my character takes a picture. And I just thought it just fitted beautifully into the book. Uh, as this sudden moment when everything seems to come together. But what was really, really interesting is that, is that much later when this book was published, um, there was a review in, in one of the newspapers here. And mm. uh, the newspaper people were very, very careful and they liked the book a lot, but they managed to find a picture of Mahila Jaya Wadna with this pigeon. So oh. somebody did take that picture. It wasn't my character, but somebody did, and they found it. Um, so it, it has been in real life. Yes, so it's a beautiful sort of connection between the real world and the imagined world coming together. Mm -hmm.
there are many more such stories in our in, since then since uh, cricket has evolved a lot as well so would you be taking a chance and penning down a story i i i might uh, mm -hmm. the only difficulty now is is that there are so many stories <laughs> and that and there's so much cricket when i was writing this it was before the premier league business started oh, in all yeah. the countries uh, it was before uh, 24 7 cricket um and you know that the kind of relationship again if you go back to the relationship between audience and object was different mm -hmm. um you had a cricket season uh you kind of got geared up for it um and so i i found that i you know it was quite emotionally exhausting following cricket mm -hmm. when i was writing this book but if we kept that same level of involvement now, we'd just be dead because it'll be all the time. It, there's no stopping. It, every, uh, it's happening somewhere, it's anytime, anywhere, in any part yeah. of the world, it's happening. Yeah, so, uh, we so, have another so it's much more difficult for me to, to latch on to something at the moment, yeah. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, in Roadkill, uh, you chose to write from the perspective of a van driver why that specific character and why a van driver this is something okay. us uh, pakistanis will also relate to okay so that story which was published in the new yorker uh, comes from this book noontide tool and this book is a collection of stories mm -hmm. but it's a bit like a novel because they're all connected the main connection is that they're all mm -hmm. told by the same van driver so the van okay. driver in Roadkill is is the one who his name is Vasanta, and he tells all mm. these stories. And the the way it works in this book is um, Vasanta has uh, retired, as people do uh, in again in this part of the world uh, at this time. He retired from a job when he was in his 50s, so he's quite young, relatively speaking, and decided that he would uh, buy a van and have it as a, as a tour van for hire. And uh, I think you have this in Pakistan mm -hmm. as well, but in Sri Lanka, it's a big thing because um, it's, it's the main vehicle that people hire if a family wants to go somewhere or if tourists want to go somewhere or... Yes. Anyone wants to go anywhere, uh, if there isn't a regular route, you hire a van um, and you do it. So his van is for hire. And it happens just about the time that the war comes to an end. So the war ends in 2009. And suddenly it's possible to travel all over the country, all over the island. So his van mm -hmm. is suddenly very popular and people want it to go to different places. And so he gets to travel to places he's never been before, particularly in the north. He's from the south. He's from Colombo. But he gets to go to Jaffna, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, where he ha wasn't able to go during the war period. He gets to go to the east coast, which he couldn't go during the war period. But he also go gets to go down south, where the tourists go, to the beaches and so on. And he takes different sorts of people. And he tells the stories of what he sees and what he finds. And it, so it's, it's, although it's about the end of the war and the trauma of it, he's also quite a happy-go-lucky guy. He tells funny stories, mostly, so he's quite humorous. Um, but when he goes north, he's quite shocked by what he sees, ashamed by things that have happened. He talks to soldiers or former soldiers, people who become been soldiers and our tour guides now about what they did, uh, what happened to them. Uh, he goes to the south and sees how tourists sort of have a very hedonistic life down there. And he's trying to trying to make sense of this world, this post-trauma world where everyone is aware of the terrible things that have happened, but kind of want to forget about it. And then there are other people who want retribution. Mm -hmm. So the stories here are divided into the north and the south. The stories where he goes north and the ones where he goes south. And because he's a van driver, it starts with a story called Full Tank. 
and it ends with a story called Running on Empty. And, and uh, we meet all these people. So there are aid workers going to help people. There are, there's a military general who commandeers his van one time. Uh, there are uh, a group of Chinese businessmen who are coming to buy some of the scrap metal from the war. So all kinds of stories. And that's why I thought the van driver was really the perfect kind of vehicle for the book to tell these stories. That's very interesting. I mean, it's like you get to, they get to know people for a short while and then the, yeah. their stories stay with them. And yeah. they become folklore and, you know, tell, retelling when sitting down and having tea and having a retelling about, I've heard this today while driving. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a lot of questions coming in asking about um, who is your favorite cricketer present time and is also anybody who's retired by now. <laughs> who is your favorite cricketer and cricket team? Well, uh cricket team, I have to say, usually it is the Sri Lankan team. Um, but what's really interesting about teams, I think, is, is the, and that's what I love about the game and the way it's developed. And the reason I kind of wrote a book about it is, is this weird way in which we identify ourselves with teams. And in cricket, for a long time, it would be, uh, you know, you would you would identify yourself with one team if they were playing. But if they were not playing, and if there were two other teams, you'd still identify with one or the other. And depending on what sort of a person mm -hmm. you are, for most of the world, I suspect, I think this is true. Given given the the history of uh, of Britain, most mm -hmm. of the time people of the world will support the team that isn't the British team if they were for, if they were there, if the two were there. But that's, then it becomes really interesting. That's a very uh, well-rounded answer. But there's also an interesting thing, like, you know, if for in the in the 60s, for example, if the West Indians were playing anybody, everybody would support the West Indian team. Um, if the Australians were playing about anybody, mm -hmm. everybody would not support the Australians. You know, it, it happens like that. It's sort of these are kind of movable things. And even in football as well, it's interesting, okay. isn't it? How people adopt teams that are not necessarily your national team. As for favorite cricketers, um, well, Kumar Sangakara is pretty high up there for me. You, uh, I mean, there's a, also a resemblance as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> I, I wish, I wish. <laughs> He's a hum he's a um, I had the honor to meet him as well when they were touring Pakistan and uh, a very humble down to earth person. And uh, for our last question of the session, any book recommendation for the students and for the audience watching, what have been your favorite read and what would you like to suggest us to give it a try? Oh my goodness, I haven't thought about. Uh book recommendations. Um, my mind goes a little blank when someone asks me something like that. Um, what have I been reading recently? Um, uh, hmm. Any fiction, non-fiction, biographies? Uh, well, I've, I've just been reading a little bit of Aldous Huxley. Um, all mm -hmm. old, old books. Um, there's mm -hmm. been a reprint of Kamala Makandaya, an Indian writer in English, um, who whose books disappeared for a few years and are just making a comeback. And I I like those. Um, what else can I suggest at the moment? Um, I'm catcher. Well, you can't mind. recommend you can't recommend your own books. No, I'm I'm recommending this as <laughs> to our audience to definitely give it uh and give do read this book. It's really really good. Kamala Shamsi. Kamala uh, Shamsi. Fire. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mr. Umesh, for joining us and giving us your uh, time. 
It has been an absolute honor and pleasure hosting this session, and I hope our audience has also enjoyed this. Uh, do read The Suncatcher. It's available in, in every bookstores in Pakistan as well as online. And stay safe, happy holidays, and a happy and new safe year. Thank you. Thank you so very much. much. And from me too, safe, safe times ahead. Thank you. Thank you.